Ready okay, to go. Cool. All right. And we are live. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our first session, our first shadowing session of 2022-2023 for Club Med Virtual. We're thankful to Dr. Gandhi for taking time out of her day to volunteer to share her journey, her experiences, and her expertise with us. Dr. Gandhi, welcome. Thank Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Awesome. Yeah, we're all excited to hear about mindfulness and medicine. Uh, I think it's a unique topic and uh, I'm ready to hear what you have to say. I know you do a lot of work on this subject, so I'm excited for it. Um, You can go ahead and start however you want. uh, If you want to give us some background and then get into the topic, whatever you want to do. Absolutely. So let me just uh, set it up a little bit and then we can share my slides. How about that? Perfect. So hi, everyone. I am Dr. Gandhi. It's it's a pleasure to be here and connect with all of you. It just gives me such joy to connect with the future generation of healthcare. So happy to see you all here. It gives me so much hope. Um, So yeah, I am a board certified family medicine physician. I've been practicing for a long time, almost two decades. And I have just this passion to empower everyone I meet on the journey of life, whether they're my patients, friends, you all um, that I come across to really take control of their own health and well being. And I feel that this topic in particular is just, I'm so passionate about it because I see how mindset is everything. And as you all, you know, embark on your journey in healthcare and have patients and take care of them. You might see what I saw as a med student very, very early on that it was what and how my patients thought about what was going on, their illnesses, their diseases, that was really going to set the tone for what was going to happen next. So I just feel that this topic, mindfulness, couldn't be more important nowadays. Um, You all know this better than me. I mean, we're constantly bombarded with information on a screen. It's it's just nonstop. And I feel like your guys' generations sees that and has feels that a lot more than me. And I feel like it's overwhelming. So I just can't imagine what it's like to be in college, um, in pre-med or, you know, a a student pursuing any kind of the health sciences, what that feels like, the stress. And so I'm just presenting this topic because I know that you all are are bright and you're going to, uh, hear about so many case studies and you can look up so much information and get experience in, you know, diseases and things like that. But I wanted to talk about this because this wasn't something that was talked about or discussed or shared at all in my education. It was something that I really had to learn on my own. And the reason I even wanted to learn anything about what this word mindfulness is or reduce my own stress was because I had a wake up call with one of my kids. Um, Yeah, she called me out and there was no turning back. So for me, I feel like when a young person, when a child looks at an adult who thinks they have it all together, I think you're so high functioning um, and they call you out and it's like, a four-year-old, you you have to take notice. So that was my wake-up call. So that being said, let me just go ahead and share my slides. Let's get that going. While Dr. Gandhi is setting that up, you guys can, um, in the audience, can feel free to, uh, you know, brainstorm some questions when she's talking and, uh, you know, you can put them in the chat or we could uh, save them for the end. We'll have a Q&A session. So whatever you guys feel most comfortable with. Great. Should I start? The floor is all yours. Okay, great. All right. Thank you so much for having me, Club Med Virtual. Here's a little bit about me. So I, as I mentioned, I'm a family medicine physician. I trained at Northridge Family Medicine Residency Program in Southern California, and I have my own wellness practice. I'm 
off and on podcasts and have recently been on a, on a radio show, public speaker, really enjoy educating everyone about health and wellness topics, as I mentioned. And I'm a host of an Instagram live series I started in 2021 called Ruminations on Gratitude, in which I talk about the science and the uh, wisdom behind this practice and how we can use it as a transformational wellness tool as I did in my life. And I can talk more about that in the Q&A. So those are my handles. Okay, so let's talk about it. Mindfulness and medicine. What is mindfulness? I hope to explore these two topics. What is mindfulness? What does mindfulness have to do with medicine? So as I said before, mindfulness was definitely not a topic that was discussed in, in my training in residency in medical school. It's You hear it all the time now, but didn't hear much about it during my days. And now we have an enormous amount of research and data that supports the role of mindfulness in our lives and in our health. So as we think about what this term actually means, I think by the end of this talk, you all will understand why Jasmine, our older dog, is the most mindful member of our family. So simply stated, mindfulness simply means entering and staying in the present moment, in the now as visionary and spiritual teacher Eckhart Tolle describes. So if we think about that, why should we practice mindfulness? Why should we stay in the present moment? Well, the number one reason is our minds require rest. And I don't know about you all, but I feel like I take better care of my phone sometimes. I'm so dedicated to charging it and making sure it's working. But do we do that with our minds? Our minds are racing all day, depending on what article you read. Some people say that our minds generate 6,000 thoughts a day, somewhere else I read was 10,000. And if you think about all the thoughts that you think, all those impulses all day, most of them have to do with the past. What happened? You know, what did she say? I hope I don't fail that test again. Or the future. Oh my goodness, the test is coming. I'm going to bump into him again. I mean, it's just nonstop. Most of the thoughts, though, have nothing to do with the moment that you're in right now. So again, mindfulness or staying in the present moment gives our mind a break from all that past and forward, back and forth thinking that we do. And so number two, it can reduce our stress levels, this practice of mindfulness. And it kind of goes against what we, what we typically learn, right? So we're always taught in our families, society, culture, school, that we should learn from our past and prepare for the future. And that sounds great. And it does work some of the time, but it doesn't work all of the time. And a great example of that has been this COVID-19 pandemic. We lost any semblance of what we thought our life was like. The pr predictability was gone. We had no idea whether, whether what strategies to use, what interventions would work, and what the future will hold. When would the next variant come? We still don't know. So, as I mentioned here, it has caused a pandemic of fear and anxiety. So sometimes, no matter how much you look at the past and how much you prepare for the future, you can't really control what's gonna happen next. So I feel like there's a book that's really great that really explains mindfulness and actually how to infuse it into the mundane, ordinary daily tasks of your day. And it's called How to Train a Wild Elephant. And it's by an author and a mindfulness teacher, Dr. Bayes. And in her book, she explains that the mind basically has two functions, thinking and awareness. She goes on to explain, and I'm going to quote, the unrestrained mind is like a feral wild elephant. It's strength scattered and lost, right? So we rely on our minds for so much. And the human mind can come up with extraordinary innovation, creativity, but like an elephant that's so majestic and beautiful and you know works well in that family unit and a herd, it can also be really destructive, like a feral wild elephant. 
when we allow the mind to attach and come into the present moment, we allow the mind to empty itself and ready itself for the next moment. And this is the way we enter awareness mode. It allows us to be more focused, less distracted, and just work more efficiently. So in this era also of toxic positivity, I feel like the goal of mindfulness is not to bypass or escape difficult or challenging situations. It's to become aware of them so that we can choose how we're going to respond to them. So let's talk about mindfulness and medicine. So why should physicians or future physicians practice mindfulness? So number one reason for stress reduction and the health benefits, mindfulness can be a very powerful stress management tool. And I specifically emphasize stress reduction via mindfulness. Um, it's my opinion, but I feel that you can follow the healthiest lifestyle, you can exercise, you can eat the right diet for your body, you can be a kind, generous person. And all of that can help your stress, but if you don't have a practice, if you don't have mindfulness as a practice in your life, nothing can replace it in terms of stress reduction. So the second reason why I feel that we should uh, practice mindfulness as physicians or future physicians is because of physician burnout. And I'm sure you all have heard about this. This was already on the rise pre-pandemic and now it's only increased and it's really global. The levels are astronomical and the reasons for this pre and pandemic related burnout are lengthy and complicated. Time for another talk, another day. While these issues obviously need to be addressed, we can use mindfulness to decrease our own stress and mental anguish and suffering. So let's talk about the science proven health benefits of a mindfulness practice. It reduces anxiety, depression, negative mood, rumination of thought, endless rumination sometimes, empathy increases, we feel a stronger sense of connection and we know that connection is a core psychological need. People who practice mindfulness tend to make healthier lifestyle choices, whether it comes to what diet they're following, substance usage, exercising enough. It actually increases and enhances immune function in our bodies. And we can measure this by measuring cytokine expression, leukocyte quantities, antibody totters after being vaccinated, there's enhanced immunoprotection from viral and bacterial diseases. So reason number three for why physicians should practice mindfulness is it can help us offer better care. And isn't that why we all are in this field or pursuing this field? We want to offer excellent care for others. So let's talk about the complaints we hear about physicians, right? And this may have happened to some of you when you've gone to see one. You felt rushed, the physicians felt rushed and seemed rushed as they were talking to you. They didn't even listen to me. They did all the talking, they kept interrupting me. They handed me a prescription and were out the door. So let's just think about it. When we're fully present, when we are in the present moment with all of our senses, we are better listeners and observers. And you all may have heard about this, but if you give the patient a chance to share their concerns for just a few minutes without interrupting them, you can get about 80% of the history portion of the history and physical. That deep listening actually validates their concerns, builds trust, builds connection and better bonding. Staying present like that can increase our efficiency and our sense of calm as we navigate our whole day, when it, whether it's labs, interruptions, messages, phone calls, and the way that we communicate with our staff. And it's a fact that physicians who listen well have less lawsuits and more satisfied patients. 
So I'm going to share a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh. Deep listening, compassionate listening is not listening with the purpose of analyzing or even uncovering what has happened in the past. You listen, first of all, in order to give the other person relief a chance to speak up, to feel that someone finally understands him or her. Deep listening is the kind of listening that helps us keep compassion alive while the other speaks. During this time, you have in mind only one idea, one desire to listen in order to give the other person the chance to speak out and suffer less. This is your only purpose. Other things like analyzing, understanding the past can be a byproduct of this work. But first of all, listen with compassion. And I know when we get very busy, we can forget to do that with patients and even loved ones. So in summary, as I stated before, a mindfulness practice is essential for stress reduction. Mindfulness be benefits our own health and helps, uh, sorry, and well being, which is crucial in our job satisfaction. It helps us hone our listening observational skills, which leads to better care for the patient. We can prescribe mindfulness as a tool that can be complementary to other wellness tools like exercise, medications, other therapies. Having healthy and connected relationships with our patients and the rest of the team builds a strong reputation in the community and leads to referrals. So how do we implement mindfulness when we're already feeling so rushed, so busy, so overwhelmed, especially when you're in college? Well, Mindfulness has been practiced by human beings for thousands of years and for good reason. And it's been practiced by many different kinds of people who come from different cultures and traditions. And so I'm gonna offer and share with you all my top three ways to practice mindfulness, breath work, meditation, and an active practice of gratitude. So we're gonna talk about breath work first. This is one of the easiest ways to reset and remind ourselves to come into the present moment because your breath is available to you as long as you're alive 24 seven. And one of my favorite techniques is called 478 and you can Google it. So you inhale for a count of four, hold it for a count of seven and then exhale for a count of eight. And doing that for five to 10 minutes reduces cortisol levels reduces your respiratory rate, your heart rate, blood pressure, and leaves you with a sense of calm. It's something that I even recommend uh, for patients who get claustrophobic or get panic attacks to help ease their, their suffering. Meditation. So this one was really scary for me, I remember, and I can share with you more in the Q&A. So, Contrary to what many people and what I initially thought, we're not supposed to sit perfectly still on the perfect cushion with the candle burning and empty our mind of all thoughts. The goal is simply to become an observer of the thousands of thoughts that bombard us. And through meditation, we learn a few things. We learn that our thoughts will come and actually go if we allow them to, with curiosity and without judging them, without getting angry that the same thought is coming up over and over, we end up feeling more calm and peaceful afterwards. And sometimes that's not during the meditation, it's not right after, it's something that you notice unfolds over days, weeks, when you've started a dedicated practice. You tend to be less reactive. How each of our individual minds work is something that you also start to learn. What are your thought patterns? What drives your thought patterns? What are some beliefs that you hold on to about yourself? So let's talk about the science. So science shows us the benefits of meditation. Functional MRIs show increased activities in different parts of the brain, like the hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, and the amygdala, we see a reduction in PTSD, anxiety, depression, pain scores, emotional regulation, and reactivity is better. It's associated with an increased parasympathetic tone. So that's the rest and digest, which ends up decreasing heart rate, blood pressure, blood cortisol levels, breathing rate, and even the muscle tension. And 
there's interesting data and research that shows that the Kirtan Kriya, which is an 11 minute Kundalini meditation has been proven in clinical trials to improve brain blood flow, reduce cortisol levels and improve memory function. So how does one meditate? There are so many apps like Calm, Chopra. There's a lot of free guided meditations on YouTube. There's courses you can take. And what ended up working for me was Vipassana meditation. I had tried so many different styles and I finally found one. So another quote, if every eight-year-old in this world is taught meditation, we will eliminate violence in the world within one generation. Dalai Lama. Let's talk about gratitude. So this is my most favorite uh, mindfulness tool. And as I shared before, gratitude has been a transformational wellness tool in my life. It really changed the trajectory of my life. It changed the way that I personally view wellness and as a person, as a human being, and as well as a physician for my patients. So when we talk about gratitude, I'm talking about an active practice of gratitude. So this is more than saying thank you when someone holds the door open for you. So the beautiful thing about gratitude and the way that it can bring us into the present moment or make us mindful is that it requires that we pause and become aware of our present set of circumstances. It forces us to enter the present moment, what's happening in front of us. Plenty of research shows that an active practice, such as journaling, is good for our health and well-being. And so, for example, that would be noting three things that happened each day that you're grateful for. So let's talk about the science. There was a study, and there's plenty of studies. If you go on PubMed and just type in gratitude, you'll find so many articles, so much research. So I'll highlight one study that found that cardiac patients that were more grateful reported better sleep, less fatigue, and lower measurable levels of cellular inflammation. And I have to talk about Dr. Robert Emmons. So he's one of the world's leading scientific experts on gratitude. And in one of his uh, landmark studies in 2010, his team took about a thousand people from the age of eight to 80 and had them jot down three experiences every day that they were grateful for. And here are the results. So in terms of their physical health, they ended up reporting stronger immune systems. They were less bothered by aches and pains. They felt refreshed and upon awakening and slept longer. They exercised more and took better care of their health in general. Their blood pressure was lower. Psychologically speaking, they were more positive. They felt more awake, had more joy, pleasure, optimism, happiness. And socially, they were more generous, more compassionate, more outgoing, and they were less lonely and isolated. And that's a really important aspect right there because America had a loneliness crisis before the pandemic and it's only gotten worse since. And this is despite all the technology we have to keep us connected. So, Feeling gratitude actually affects our neurotransmitter levels in our brain, such as dopamine and serotonin. And when, our, when those are affected, those affect our mood. And that directly affects our perspective, our thoughts, and decisions. And also, if you, if you try it, you can't possibly feel envious and grateful at the same time. This is an example of reciprocal inhibition. So gratitude also offers resilience to trauma. And that's, that's really important for us to become more trauma informed as a society and certainly in healthcare because we're realizing now how much that impacts a person's well-being, their diseases, their propensity to develop certain illnesses. So it helps to reframe past trauma to bring some meaning from it. And it also helps inoculate people from future traumatic events. And the way that it does that is it kind of shifts the way the preference of your brain circuitry. So we have the brain's defense circuitry, which is kind of responsible for backing up and freezing when danger is upon you. 
And then you have the pro-social circuitry or networks that have to do more with well-being and happiness. And so practicing gratitude actually helps kind of shift you towards the more pro-social circuitry and therefore it affects your perspective. New research actually shows that sharing potentiates the health benefits. So there was a study in which they took um, Holocaust survivors and they had those survivors of the, this horrific Holocaust um, and everything they've been through actually share what they were grateful for in strangers. And so they were videotaped and they were sharing the kindness of strangers during this horrific time in their life. And so they actually had complete strangers watch those videos and their levels of gratitude increased just from watching a stranger share their levels of gratitude. So what I mean is sharing what you're grateful for off potentiates the gratitude feeling in each person. And therefore both people get the health benefits, which is really interesting. So in my opinion, gratitude is a superpower. It's a tool we all have available 24 seven and within seconds, it can really quiet that inner critic. And that can be faster than IV medications. And so as I shared before, I hope I'll see some of you there, but I do host a weekly series called Ruminations on Gratitude. And we talk all about the science behind it and how we can thread it into our daily lives. And I'll share a quote. Gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we had into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos into order, confusion to clarity, it can turn an existence into a real life and disconnected situations into important and beneficial lessons. Gratitude makes sense of our past, brings peace for today and creates a vision for tomorrow. Melody Beatty. And so some advice from me for future physicians, regard your, your patients as teachers, listen deeply and never stop learning. Thank you for joining. This is my new puppy, Luna, who's three months old. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Gandhi. Um, we can open up for questions. Uh, if anybody else, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can feel free to unmute yourself and speak up, or you can send them in the chat and I can read them for you. You can um, also send them personally to me uh, if you want to remain anonymous and I can read them out for you. And I can start off with a question. Um, you mentioned in the beginning of your talk that your one of your children uh, called you out and <laughs> kind of started you on this journey of mindfulness. So I don't know if that story is too personal, but if no, it's not- No, it's not. I'm curious. No, I'm so glad you asked. Thank you for asking. You know, I share it in the hopes that, you know, it might help someone else. Um, so yeah, I was, I was a couple years in, so I was probably in my thirties. I had these two little kids and one was a toddler. One was about four years old and I, I had done my work and, um, you know, I finally, had a, a house and I was finally chipping away at my college loans and my med school loans. And so, you know, on paper, like everything was checking off, you know, okay, you're, you're finally not renting anymore. You're paying some loans. You have two amazing little kids. This is great. You have a career. You love your patients. Wonderful. Like the list was going really well. And um, I remember I picked them up from school and then, you know, we had to start, you know, everything. The, the nighttime agenda as a parent. So it was like, okay, let's, you know, get them bathed. And so they were in the shower and they were like these little kids are throwing water at each other, frolicking, having so much fun. And I was sitting outside waiting for my older one to come out with a towel. And all I could think about in my head was like, oh my God, I have to like dry them and then put lotion on and then get their pajamas. And then I need to get dinner started and then I need to feed them. And then I should probably check in and see what my schedule is going to be like tomorrow. And, you know, the wheels were just turning. 
And um, so, you know, I was, I'm sure I did that many times before this day. So I, I'm, my daughter comes out, my older one, she's four, I'm drying her. And she was just like, mommy, mommy. And, and I finally like snapped awake and she was like, mommy, I want you to be happy. Why are you so sad? And I just thought, oh my gosh, why is she feeling? How could she tell? I thought, you know, I, I, everything was so put together. I was doing great at everything. Well, obviously I wasn't. I thought I was so high functioning, but my daughter saw right through all of it. And she was really upset. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. And so I felt horrible. I felt like, wow, like why is a four-year-old feeling my stress? This has nothing to do with her. And so it just kind of got me thinking, and I'd love to tell you guys, like that was the day I just the switch flipped and I started practicing, practicing mindfulness. No, it just got me thinking. And I started like looking at my life and, and thinking like, okay, I thought I had it all together, but obviously I don't. And it just got me thinking, wow, you know what? I need to really manage my stress better. I mean, here I am preaching to my patients and I don't have it together myself. And so it just opened my eyes to a lot of different practices of wellness, not just practicing this traditional sort of wellness model. And I think I saw a clip of Oprah and she said, you know, um, writing a gratitude journal, keeping a gratitude journal changed her life. So I thought, well, I should do that. I mean, here I am, you know, the, the prescription of life, I'm checking off the boxes. I'm in, and there's so many people that suffer. And here I am, you know, doing relatively really well. And I'm not even feeling grateful. I'm just feeling stressed. So it just got the wheels turning and I started writing a gratitude journal. And, and before that, I would have thought that was so woo woo. What is that about? Come on, um, who does that? But I knew that I needed to change my parenting and I needed it. it my stress levels were affecting my kids. And so I just started and it actually just changed my life, literally. Your daughter is a true empath. <laughs> I'm not going to tell her because she'll get a big head. No, I'm kidding. Right. <laughs> no, she's a sweetheart. Well, yeah, we, we always talk about, you know, finding things that we're grateful for, especially amidst like, you know, hard times or possibly even tragedies. So, uh, you know, if we're using that medicinally, let's say, um, you know, during times of, you know, mental anguish, then how much more are the benefits going to be reaped if we, you know, do that on a regular basis? Because, you know, if we're only remembering to do that when times are hard, then uh, it's almost like, you know, being too late to the, the, the war against, you know, your, your negative thoughts or the negative situation in your life. So, um, I, I'm definitely going to pick one up. Yeah. No, I, I'm definitely going right. to start journaling. You're absolutely right. And, you know, I'll tell you, I never want to seem like, you know, there's, like I mentioned before, there's so much of this toxic positivity out there. Like, you know, just shake it off, you know, Look at the people suffering in X, Y, Z. I mean, why are you complaining? You have it so good. You have food on your table. You're able to, and that's so true. I mean, we are all, you know, if we're all here right together right now, we do have some amount of privilege and access and we should be so grateful for that. Absolutely. But I don't want to bypass the validating feeling unhappy, feeling depressed, feeling anxious, feeling like, something sucks in your life. Like, let's just say it, you know, I mean, bad things happen to everyone and we're not here to compare people's pain and, and decide who gets to, you know, complain more or not. I'm not saying that at all. What I feel like having a gratitude journal really does. It's, it's just like, it's, it's a way to, to just take a break from all that thinking, think about what works for you. What did you like and what worked for you that day? And as you start driving down that journal, you're kind of look at the other pages and you're like, you kind of notice like, huh, it really works when I do X, Y, Z. I feel good or I like spending time with so-and-so. They feel good. They seem like a good person. Just simple things like that. And you just start learning about yourself. And that's what it is, right? And you just give your brain a break, literally, for five minutes hopefully you sleep better. I feel like, you know, 
I wish I knew some of this when I was in school like you guys, because maybe I would have done better on my tests <laughs> because I was always so stressed, right? I mean, the amount of stress and anxiety when you're a student, I, I remember those days, so. Yeah, and, and based on what you're saying, it seems like, um, you know, keeping that journal and writing these things down and seeing them on paper, it's like, it'll help you remember the things that you're great, grateful for to help you remember to try to implement those more often or, or to gravitate towards those things or those people or whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, again, just increasing that, you know, cascade effect. That's exactly it, right? And when you feel your feelings and you know let's say there's something that you're not grateful for right it's awful just taking a minute to say okay wait a minute you know it could have been worse i could have gotten a worse score okay well that just gives you a pause and then you back up and say okay it is what it is now this is the score i got what can i do about it now right like you feel your feelings you're upset for a few days you're mad you're thinking about what you could have done what you should have done now we get into problem solving mode. Okay, this happened. It's done. What can I do now? Do I need a tutor? Do I need to study with so and so? Should I not have gone out? Like, whatever. That's just an example. But, right. And then you get into creativity and problem solving mode. Right, right. Uh, we have a question from the chat from Genevieve. Uh, she says, as a patient slash physician, how do you handle a situation where an individual may make you feel rushed or not heard in your concerns? Great question. Yeah, that's a great question. So I just to clarify, so as a patient or the physician, like both perspectives? Seems like that. Okay, absolutely. So, uh, unless, you know, yeah, she said yes. yes. Okay, no, that's such a good question, Genevieve. So I feel like as a patient, you've got to advocate for yourself, right? And so you've got to say, excuse me, I need further discussion on this topic. Um, do we need to set up another appointment or can, can this be addressed right now? You know, I would, I would advocate. Um, it, and I know it's not always easy, but I, I would certainly advocate. I feel like sometimes having a list is really great when patients come in with a list and so I'll look at the list and sometimes I, I know I can't get to everything on that list, but we'll break them down and I'll tell them, you know, I feel like this is more of a priority. Can we let's split this up into two appointments? So as, as the physician, and I think also I've really realized the less I interrupt, more flow, more comes out, you know, and it's so hard, right? Because I mean, physicians and other people in the healthcare team always complain like, there's not enough time I want to do more there's not enough time they're rushing us so much they're giving us so many patients if somehow it's not easy if somehow you can let them talk without interrupting like I said even just a couple minutes you'll actually get so many answers to your questions and then you can really hone in on what else you need to know the other thing is is I noticed, you know, I used to be such an interrupter, I feel like, you know, and, and maybe we're taught to be that way, you know, we're not kind of taught to pause and listen. What I noticed when I cut people off and interrupt them, like the entire flow of the conversation completely goes in a different way, you know, or, or when that happens to me, I notice that. And so as I get older and I learn more about this and I become more mindful, I realize how unnecessary it is to speak before I listen. Definitely. Yeah, I've definitely felt rushed both as a patient and as a medical assistant. And, uh, you know, I, I, I resonated with what you said on one of your slides where, uh, you know, it builds trust and it builds, um, you know, confidence and, and that they're being heard and, and being taken care of because, you know, I might have a set list of questions that I'm coming in to ask the patient but if you know the patient has something unique or that's not on my list of questions that might be related and significant um, you know if I'm just cutting them off and just getting the information I think I need then uh, we might miss something big so I've definitely experienced that from both sides so I think that was a great question yeah great question uh, if you guys have any more questions, you guys can feel free to unmute yourselves or put them in the chat. 
Um, I do have another question. You uh, mentioned the all the health benefits um, in terms of lowering your you know heart rate and blood pressure and other things like that. Here, um, and I was just wondering um, if that effect is transient um, or only as long as you're practicing this um, or does it have like long-term effects like if you let's say you don't do it for a week are, are you going to have a hot, uh, you know lower heart rate for a while or how does that work no I mean I think that's such a great question I don't know that anyone has studied that exactly but you know I would compare it to exercising right like you know, if you exercise, you know the health benefits that happen, right? We don't need to go into that. But you can't just exercise once and like, bam, we're good. We have a six pack and, you know, <laughs> right? Like we've got the endorphins. We feel fantastic. I wish that's not the case. Um, so it's a practice. It's a practice. And I, I do think, though, that overall the trend that I see is people who actively practice it are able to come back to to their center be less reactive and um you know all of those numbers are better and they just come back uh they aren't they respond more and it becomes a way of life it almost becomes something that you know when you feel you found something that works for you you want to do it and that's what i would say it's hard to answer that question, but I would say overall, anecdotally, that's what I notice. Yeah. Um, well, regardless, I mean, I feel like as long as you keep practicing it, then the benefits stay just like with exercise. Um, so I, I'm glad that you shared that because, you know, I've heard a lot about meditation and I've heard a lot of, and, you know, mindfulness and gratitude and all that. Um, and I've heard that there was some science, but now that I'm, you know, seeing some sources presented by a doctor, uh, and being taught this, uh, definitely going to look into it more and start implementing some of this stuff. Yeah, no, I'm so glad to hear it. Believe me, before I would have been like, what is this? You know, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't have spent much time on this at all, unfortunately, very unfortunately. But yes, there is research and data. And, you know, just get on PubMed, type in gratitude or meditation, mindfulness, so much will come up. And we have to remember that these practices have been going on for thousands of years, right? There's a reason that human beings have these practices and, and you just have to find what works for you. Uh, I try to get my kids to do the gratitude journaling. They're both teenagers. So that was a flop, obviously. But what wins, what wins for them is Sometimes if I'm driving them in the car from carpool and I'm like, so what are you grateful for? Give me a couple of things. And they just share it, right? And remember, I told you guys, it's so interesting and fascinating that, you know, just hearing me hearing about their, what they're grateful for, that may have nothing to do with me. They don't say they're grateful for me. So don't worry. Um, they, uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> they are deep down, you know, don't worry. <laughs> oh, it's all good. No, but what I mean to say jokingly is that it, I just feel good. I feel good hearing about that, right? Or, or, you know, like I said, in that study where like complete strangers were hearing about these Holocaust survivors had gratitude despite all the awful atrocious things they had been through. They had gratitude for, for some kind people along the way. And the, the stranger was listening and, you know, score, their gratitude scores went up. It's amazing, right? Do you, do you know if those videos are, like published online or anywhere? You know, I, I read accessed. it in an article, so I don't know. I mean, you know, one one could, I guess they might be. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, the article was published, so I wonder um, if they would allow them. But so interesting yeah. though, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I could find those through a Google search or something. Oh, yeah. Um, no other questions in the chat. I was um, thinking about the um, the one slide where you said that we're going to realize why your dog is the most mindful <laughs> member, I guess, uh, of, of your family. So I'm going to go ahead and guess that the dog is not really concerned much about the past or the future. And he or she is just aware of his present needs. And uh, am I kind of on the right track there? Or You're absolutely right. 
Peter. Yes. Yes. You know, so dogs and pets, but I'll, I'll talk about dogs because that's what I have. So my dog Jasmine is eight and dogs just have a way of just being present. They're happy. They let things go. If they're unhappy, they feel that feeling. Then they move on to the next moment. They typically don't hold grudges. They're so present. They're so present. And, um, my, one of my favorite things to do is when I walk my older dog, my puppy's a little crazy right now, but when I walk my older dog, Jasmine, she's so curious, you know, she, that's when I really notice how present she is, is she's listening to every sound. She's smelling every flower. She's listening. She's a, she's a watching everything, um, just fully in the present moment. And it reminds me like, don't look at your phone, just be it's 10, 15 minutes. You don't have 10, 15 minutes to just enjoy nature, enjoy her, enjoying nature, you know? And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I always think about when I'm, I'm with her on the walk, but yes, so, you were right. So you, so gaining inspiration, not only from your four-year-old daughter, but from your dog and yes. all, all these uh, teachers that have wisdom for us yes. that we would not expect. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And you know, we all have our own inner wisdom too. And you can really tap into that when you start a mindfulness practice, because what ends up happening is it's not like you're stopping all these thoughts, right? You're just, you're just kind of acknowledging the ones that keep coming up, the noisy ones. And once you acknowledge and observe them, what you make room and space for what really is important to emerge like something some true creativity from you a knowing you know like just something as simple as um hey i should i should totally publish that that is such a good idea you know like things like that or you know now i finally figured out why a connects to b in my life gosh why am i doing that still why am i continuing that pattern little little things like that start to come through because you've created a space that's how you tap into your inner creativity and wisdom or voice or whatever you want to call it so so if you're acknowledging all the thoughts that are coming to you and then your brain starts focusing on one thought just let that let it be, let it, let it calm. Don't focus yeah, on, you, you know, it's, it's, a it's, it takes, it's like a muscle, like it takes practice. So what I tell people is, um, initially I thought when you said in medication, meditation, you just like punch away all these thoughts, you know, you're like fighting them, especially the ones that are really annoying <laughs> and pesky, not the case. So what you're going to do is you're going to become the observer and kind of be the one watching all the thoughts come. And so it's kind of like being at the airport and uh, being at baggage claim and just watching all the luggage, waiting for your luggage. So you see your, you see all the different suitcases, but you don't pick one up, you know? And sometimes you do, you, you know, get caught in the thought, then you think about this and you go on a tangent and then you're like, wait a minute, I'm meditating, let it go. Okay, right. that thought came, that thought came, great. Or it's sometimes like being at the train station and these trains are whizzing by their thoughts. You just don't get on. You will sometimes. And I have to say, even if you sit there and you just feel like all you've done has been assaulted and bombarded with all these thoughts and you went off on all sorts of tangents and you know now you're done and you have to move on and do other things during your day, just that in and of itself has given your mind a break. It's, it's just uh, allow those thoughts to come and pass. They'll actually stop bothering you as much if you do that. Um, I wanna let people who may wanna unmute themselves and ask a question, uh, an opportunity. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of questions that could be asked because uh, you know meditation and mindfulness is something that we hear about a lot, but um, we might not necessarily know exactly how to implement um or what the end goal is so there's a lot of a lot of uh questions that you may have regarding um the implementation or some of the science or the studies or the health benefits behind it so if anybody wants to unmute themselves uh go ahead if not the chat is always open
Okay, so uh, if nobody uh, has oh, questions, oh, go ahead. No, you're good. I was just gonna ask, um, so with all like the mindfulness and things like that, do you implement more like of a holistic approach in your practice with towards patients? Because I know that's becoming a like more common in a sense, or all of this talk about mental health and being, um, I guess more naturopathic is coming in. I was wondering, is that something that you connect with mindfulness or not, or just in like mental health and like holistic approaches to medicine? Sorry, there's an echo. I'm just sitting in a lecture hall alone, so. <laughs> no, those are great questions. Thank you for asking. So for me, yes, I like to integrate um, science proven practices of all kinds. So that's why I feel like mindfulness is backed by science and um, I like to integrate it into my practice and into my talks and education with patients. Um, I find, you know, the traditional model of, of medicine that we practice here has a lot of um, influence by insurance companies as well as some pharmaceutical companies and we need both, so I'm not anti anything. But there can be some biases and I feel that even people who have so much privilege and access don't always feel that their, their health is really optimized in the current setting. And that's people who have tons of privilege. Um, so forget about people who don't. So I feel that it's so important to, uh, for me as, as a physician, uh, to, to be very open to all the different types of tools there are in the toolbox. And for me personally, I like to see the science behind it. Um, I like to understand it very well before I implement and recommend anything. And I like to offer it to the right patients. You know, there are some patients who meditation, no, that's not happening. They're not interested in it, but maybe the breathing exercises could be something they could do that would give them some ease and might end up helping with their blood pressure, you know? So it's just explaining, offering a variety of tools um, and integrating these practices that you feel very confident and comfortable with. No, that's yeah. a good point that you bring up of the, like how there is so much bias and influence from outside um, that affects a lot of the ways that um, patients are treated. I'm sure um, like as I guess it becomes more of a trend in the medical society. People also do more research on it. So I'm sure um, it'll like come along, but um, I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you for asking. So we only have a few more minutes left. Um, I'm gonna send out this get involved survey. Um, if you wanna fill that out, um, whoever was here. Um, and you can get participation uh, and a certificate for your shadowing hours at the end of the semester. Um, and uh, while you guys are filling that out, um, I have one more quick question for you, Absolutely. Dr. Gandhi. Um, so I'm thinking about starting on this journey and I'm sure most people in here are too. What would you say is the biggest hindrance to beginning the journey? Is it maybe finding time actually having to schedule this in at specific times, or maybe what's the biggest hindrance if you've already gotten started, what's the thing that maybe kind of keeps you from continuing it? I'm sure you face times in you know, your journey where you've been more or less motivated to do it. So uh, maybe just share some of the, the hindrances and, and how did you overcome those or how could we overcome those just to keep this as a practice? That's such a great question. I'm so glad you asked. And yes, absolutely. There have been times where I was like, I just need to sleep. I can't even, I can't even function right now. And maybe I didn't get enough sleep. Um, no. So, you know what, what I tell people is, is try to focus. And I know it's so hard when you're a student, it's so hard. I remember those times. Um, I kind of break it down into like seven wellness tools that I think are really important that we, we integrate into our life and you can't do all seven, seven of them every day because that's impossible. 
Um, but maybe you could do one a day. And so my top seven is the first one is thinking about passion. What lights you up? What do you, what are your hobbies? What have you been really interested in? Um, and it has nothing to do with anyone else. It has nothing to do with your career path. It has nothing to do with looking good on your resume. No, nope, it's just what you like. It just lights you up. And whether that means like, you know, um, watching your favorite team play or it's, you know, a hobby, maybe it's reading, maybe it's, you know, watercolor painting, whatever it is. So making sure you schedule that in the calendar. It, it, maybe it can't be weekly, maybe it's once a month, but even as a busy student, as a busy whatever, this busyness does not stop guys. I have to tell you, <laughs> like, I'm just letting you know, like it's a certain kind of busy when you're a student and you think, okay, it'll get better. And it does in certain ways when you're out there working and whatever you do, but, but it just keeps changing. The form of it keeps changing, right? So you, so there's some things that are just non-negotiable. So one of them is making sure you're scheduling some type of passion that you have into your calendar. Like, all right, you know, you look at the calendar, on this day, you are going to work ahead and work around and you're gonna go attend this event because it's just something you love. That's it, you're gonna do it. So that kind of thing, that's really important. They're in no particular order. The second one is sleep. We all know how well we take care of our phones and devices, right? So I don't even need to say how much, especially as a student, you're staying up, you're, you're sat having to sacrifice. So just doing the best you can and trying to sleep or get naps and like try your best with that. Um, it's so important. And, you know, what's what we're hearing so much more about is getting that morning light in. I don't know if you guys have been hearing a lot about that, right? Like how important it is 10, 15 minutes without your sunglasses on to get morning light even more on cloudy days. So it really helps your sleep wake cycle because it actually directly affects your pineal gland, which is where melatonin is made. Oh boy, I don't wanna to go too far into this. We probably have to get going soon. Uh, the, the next one is connection, making sure that you are integrating time to connect with people that you actually like, that it's easy with, that just easy, good energy with, you know, into your, into your week, into your day, into your month, definitely, make sure to seek that out. We are not meant to be alone in these, this life. Even if you think you're an introvert, you need connection. And we learned that from the pandemic. Everyone needs connection. The next one is nutrition, right? So again, I remember as a student that was not high on my priority list, but just hydrating, right? Like actually getting some vegetables and fruit and actually, you know, trying to do the right thing and not over caffeinate yourself and all the other things. Um, and then exercise again, I know all of these are so challenging when you guys are working so hard, but just trying, even if it means a 15 minute walk, it's shocking what, you know, a 10, 15 minute walk can do. It's amazing. It just, just clears your head. Everything, everything seems to be better after a walk, right. Or a good night's rest, things like that. Um, and let's see, I think I mentioned all of them and then stress relief by a mindfulness. That was the last one. So I talked all about that. So I don't need to get into that. You guys know what that is. And so it's so easy, you know, starting with a little gratitude journal, like just write three things down before you go to bed, three things, um, or just do a voice memo, call your mom, text your mom and say, mom, I'm, these are the three things I'm grateful for. They would love to hear that, <laughs> right? I think that's a great point. Uh, and even to end off on is um, I think the easiest way to implement at least just one of these is just find a partner. Maybe it's somebody in here or maybe you could send this recording uh, that we'll post on YouTube to one of your friends who might be interested in this and just have a partner that you could kind of, uh, you know, hold each other accountable with and, uh, you know, ask each other at a specific time of the day or something like, hey, give me three things that you're grateful for today. And you never know, you might be texting your partner when they're having, you know, the worst mental crisis of their life, you know, just fail the test or something True. and, you know, uh, or, 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 conversely you sharing your experience just like the holocaust survivors might give them hope during their crisis or whatever they're going through so uh well thank you so much for dr gandhi for all your time for uh sharing all that with us uh you definitely motivated and inspired me to uh definitely look into this more and start implementing it uh my friends who have been preaching to me 
are going to love you. I'm definitely going to send this to a few people, this video to a few people. And um, uh, I appreciate you. Uh, if you want to drop any uh, handles, I know you talk about uh, your podcast earlier. You had a slide on there. So if anybody wants to uh, look back at this video, all that will be posted. Um, but if you want to drop anything in the chat and plug maybe your Instagram or Twitter or whatever else uh, you sure. want, uh, go ahead so people could have easy access to that. Thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure. I loved all of your questions. Thank you for the warm introduction and welcome. Really appreciated my time spent with all of you all. For sure. It was great having you. Um, I can tell you do podcasts. <laughs> you've, been, uh, you've been great to speak with. Okay, so my Instagram, guys, is uh, Dr. Gandhi. Oh, I typed that wrong. I'm old, guys. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> is uh, Dr. Gon the underscore wellness. And I'm mainly on Instagram. I did just open a TikTok, which I'm just really trying to learn how to use. <laughs> so that's probably the best place to find me. And then in my link tree, there's all the podcasts and, and I you know, try to share all these little tips and tools to help empower everybody. But yeah, I would love to connect with you guys and best of luck just seeing all of your names and faces and talking to you all just gives me so much hope for the next generation. I'm so excited. We're going to be in good hands. Thank you and all the best to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Gandhi. Thank Absolutely. you. All the best to you. And thank you, everybody, for showing up. This has been a Club Med virtual shadowing session, and we appreciate your time. And we'll see you guys next time.